You know something, Tim? We have published more than 300 episodes of Behavioral Grooves, and we've had some really great guests talking about some really important behavioral science research and application issues. But I've got to tell you that our guest today, at least in my opinion, was one of the best that we've ever had. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Kurt. It's not just that he's a Harvard professor and he's done some really great research and he wrote a book on a very important topic, racism, that is. You know, for me, it's that he integrated his research and his personal experience with rare applause. Oh, yeah. And he did it fantastically. It's just crazy. We're talking about Dr. Robert Livingston, a man whose work has already contributed to the way that we understand process and do something about racism in America. Robert is the author of one of our favorite books from this year, and it's called The Conversation, How Seeking and Speaking the Truth About Racism Can Radically Transform Individuals and Organizations. The book provides a compass for all those seeking to begin the work of anti-racism, especially corporate leaders, the people who have a lot of influence over the way systems and corporate policies are developed and maintained. We wanted to talk to Robert about the book, in part because he addresses the problem of racism in a passionate but thoughtful manner. His research and narrative are expertly combined for an audience who is really pretty familiar with taking action. So if you're interested in some pithy feel-good story about like how racism is over and done with or that overcoming this issue is easy, this is not the book. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> and although racism still exists, Robert is quick to point out that it is a solvable problem. And as he states, quote, I want to qualify my emphatic yes with it is a solvable problem, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be solved, unquote. And with this book, as he states, he hopes to close the gap of moving it from that possible to probable. Oh, I love that. I love that. And there are an abundance of examples that racism is alive and well, sadly. And Robert is very hopeful, even among all of these, for a future free of racial discrimination. Yeah, we think that this book should be a required reading for leaders or really anyone who shares the goal of building a more equitable future for our world, a world without racism or at least with less of it. And that just appear to be better, it will be a better world with less crime, stronger communities, and more productive workforces around the world. Yeah. I, just a quick shout out to Louis Mitchell for his help in coordinating this wonderful conversation with Robert. Just want to say thanks, Louis. It's always cool to meet people along our journey who extend a helping hand even before we get to know each other. Yeah, so, that's so, it. Thank you, Louis. And with that, Groovers, we invite you to sit back and relax with a tall glass of hope and optimism about our future and enjoy our conversation with Robert Livingston. Robert Livingston, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, we are excited to have you, and we start with a speed round. So I get the first question. Robert, would you rather travel on a fixed itinerary or no itinerary at all? No itinerary at all. That's an easy one. You are a man after my same <laughs> heart. I love it. I love it. All right. Uh, okay, so which do you prefer, coffee or tea? Coffee. That was a pretty easy answer, too. Yep. Wow. Yep. You're not hesitating a bit on this. No. <laughs> references. There you go. Okay. All right. Well, this one, this one, uh, we think we might have grabbed something from your book that might have some importance here. Brussels sprouts or chocolate pecan pie? Ooh, chocolate pecan pie. Good answer. <laughs> Bourbon chocolate pecan pie. Bourbon. Oh, Ooh. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, you know. Once again, you are, you know, tugging at my heartstrings there. I got well, I just I just moved to, to North Carolina, so I'm hoping to find somebody that's got that, something like that down here. Yeah, yeah. Hope, hopefully. Okay, this is sort of a, a yes-no question. Okay. So pretty, pretty simple. Is racism a solvable problem? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are we are excited because that's what we're here to talk about that and and about your wonderful new book, The Conversation: How Seeking and Speaking the Truth About Racism Can Radically Transform Individuals and Organizations. So, before we start getting into some of the more detailed kind of questions that we have and kind of having conversation about that, 
Uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit about what the book is intended to do and the mission that you, you want to achieve? Yeah. So, you know, part of it, I think, follows up on your last question uh, about whether racism is a solvable problem. And, you know, I work with lots of organizations uh, to try to move the needle in a profound and sustainable way. And, you know, I just want to qualify my emphatic yes with (laughs) it is a solvable problem, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be solved. So if we look at lots of problems facing individuals and organizations, so, you know, the challenge of losing weight, the perennial challenge, you know, if someone came to me and said, I want to lose 80 pounds, can I do it? Well, the answer is yes. But will you lose the 80 pounds? The answer is probably not. So, you know, I I, I make a distinction between what is possible uh, versus what is probable. And my book really seeks to close the gap between those two things by providing a compass and a roadmap for how, you know, leaders of private, public, nonprofit organizations, uh, world leaders, ordinary individuals can actually make it a reality, um, this possibility. And and so that's really what the whole book is about. And that's the central thesis that racism is a solvable, racism is a solvable problem. And there are really things that we can do. I I love that. You you note in the book, uh, and I just want to quote this from the book, the conversation is one of the most powerful ways to build knowledge, awareness, and empathy, and ultimately impact change. Can you expand on that? Uh, Tell us a little bit why conversation is so crucial to when it comes to overcoming racism. Yeah, so, you know, it was a bit of a surprise to me. You know, early on in my career, I thought data was the end-all, be-all. That if you wanted to persuade someone or or change their mind, you just gave them quote-unquote facts. And you say, here you go, you know, drop the mic in the story. But what I found, you know, and, and, you know, one story that I talk about in the book is when I uh, spoke to a police force and there was one black officer on the force and there was a lot of racism. And I came armed with a ton of data to show them, you know, incontrovertible evidence um, indicating that, you know, there was bias within the department, there was bias in the U.S., there was bias in the world. And I'm so proud of myself to have dancing across stage, showing them graph after graph. And they're just sort of, you know, looking at me, yawning, eyes blazing over. And, you know, it wasn't until the one black officer broke down in tears and, and everyone's like, oh, you know, what's, what's wrong? That's Jim, you know, and he's like telling stories uh, about racist incidents that happened to him in this particular town. So once he was uh, walking around in his uniform and one of the citizens called the police on him. <laughs> and it was, you know, a bit of an awkward incident because the police showed up uh, being called on another police officer walking the beat. But he was a black man and, it, you know, it was hazing. And, and, and after telling a series of stories, because he had to get it off his chest, all the officers looked at me and said, you know, Dr. Livingston, we got to do something about this racism thing. This is real. And I thought to myself, are you kidding me? Like, I just spent the last 90 minutes giving you data, random assignment, large samples, thousands of people, and it takes one story. And rather than fighting that, I thought, ah, I should know this already. You know, Danny Kahneman, who was on your show, uh, talked about this 50 years ago in the 1970s. You know, the availability heuristic and now one vivid example, um, you know, is really worth a thousand Uh, data points in in gold. So that was why I decided to really, rather than resisting it, to capitalize on the power of human connection, the power of stories, the power of dialogue. Um, There's another famous study that I cite in the book about uh, workers at the Red Cross who were being persuaded to serve more organ meat, hearts, livers, kidneys, you know, sweetbreads. And in one condition, they're given just data information on why they should serve organ meat. And it turns out there's lots of good reasons. Uh, it, it's, it's cost effective because a lot of that gets thrown out. Uh, and this was post-World War II, so there were food shortages. It's also very nutritious, very good for you, and, and a host of other reasons. In the other condition, they were given the same reasons, but they were given 30 minutes to talk about it. And they then looked at the compliance rate in both groups prior to the intervention the rate of serving organ meat was zero. No one no one did it. Afterwards, in the data-only condition, it went from 0% to around 3 or 4%, which was some movement. But in the uh, condition where they got information and conversation, it skyrocketed to around 35%. So there really is something primal and, and fundamentally human and very effective uh, about 
conversation. And there's a lot of power in dialogue. And I wanted to sort of capture that in the book and in the title. So, the, I mean, what you just talked about, that the, the, the difference between a 3% increase and a 30 plus percent increase in, in compliance because of 30 minutes of conversation. What is it that is underlying that? And we've talked to lots of people who, who again, you know, the, the idea that information in and of itself is usually not enough to drive behavior change. You talked again at the beginning about losing weight and we had Katie Milkman on and she's talking about, you know, we all know we should lose weight and we know that what we actually need to do in order to do it, yet that doesn't get us to do it. So what is it about conversation that changes that information gap, in other words, from from information to behavior? What What is it about the conversation that makes that happen? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do have some thoughts about it. And I think there's some, you know, data uh, to back it up. And that would be a whole other podcast if we got into, you know, <laughs> cool, <laughs> cool. People, you know, communication scholars and the de- communications department study this kind of thing. But I would say, you know, there's about three or four things going on. One is, I think it creates a greater sense of empathy, right? So when you're able to talk to someone and share ideas, it increases the likelihood that you will listen to them and they will listen to you and the information will be digested. I think relationships, when you build empathy and you build relationships, relationships serve as a portal for facts to enter and learning to occur. Most of the learning that occurs in our lifetime is through the context of some sort of relationship, whether it's primary caregivers uh, or, or, or someone. So I think there's something unique about learning from people that you have a relationship with and you've established a certain amount of rapport and social connection and, 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 empathy, and empathy and trust. I think there's also a, a groupy component to it as well. And there's a lot of people who study group dynamics. And so, you know, identification, and it doesn't take very much for people to identify with a group. It turns out we're wired to, and, you know, you can have people look at dots on a page and say, guess how many dots they are and call them overestimators or underestimators. And they will start to identify as that and discriminate against other groups who are not part uh, 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 of that social category. Um, so I think also what happened in that situation was that there was a certain group cohesion that that was created by the process of having a dialogue among people there. And we know that when you have a group, whether it's a human group or whether it's a herd, that you get conformity and that people tend to sort of adjust their behavior to the expectations of others within that tribe or, or that herd. And, and, you know, there are a lot of people who study uh, the dynamics of group behavior. So, and I think there's other things as well, um, but those are just a couple of, of reasons that I think um, talking to someone. And then I think it also shows mutual respect and validation that I think people like to be affirmed and having someone listen to what you have to say. And in turn, you're listening to what someone else has to say, um, I think validates what's being said versus just reading it on a sheet of paper. Um, there's a certain social dynamic that creates greater value to the information that's being exchanged uh, when it's a conversation. You know, it's interesting. We've we've talked to uh, some researchers that work with conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theories and things. And it's interesting because they talk about the same thing, that building that relationship, uh, developing empathy, you know, validation, that these are fundamental to kind of getting into the, the mind of the conspiracy theorist. Uh, and, and if you're going to have any chance of affecting some change, that it's that it starts with relationship and you rely on the on the a model in the book quite a bit the press model the problem awareness root cause analysis empathy strategy sacrifice um, that I, I think is is really cool as sort of a foundation and we don't have to go through the whole thing but what were the parts that that you felt like when when you're developing out this this press model that you felt like wow this is something that's really missing like we need, we need to really make sure that we're getting this right and, and, and we're missing it now. Well, I thought most of it was missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. The only thing there was strategy. You know, I would go into an organization, a leader would say, just tell us what to do. You know, and if we go back to the weight loss example, you imagine someone wants to lose pounds, 10 pounds and they're like, just tell me what to do. I, I mean, that wouldn't be a really helpful question because it's so obvious and there's so many different things that you can do and they all involve uh, some combination of eating less or eating differently and moving more. It, you know, I mean, everybody knows that. And yet, 
you know, I haven't lost the 10 pounds. And so the question is why? Clearly, it's not just about strategy. Um, it's not hard to come up with strategy, um, it, you know, especially for something that's that's not rocket science. You know, organization comes to me and they say, gosh, we don't have very many people of color. What do we do? Well, hire more people of color. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You know, You're a genius. <laughs> yes. You know, someone says, I, I, I really want to stop smoking. I don't know what to do. Do not put a cigarette in your mouth and light it. OK, you know, so, I, you know, but, but uh, clearly it's a lot more complicated than that. And so yes. the press model is really building around the sort of actions, the action or strategy required to um, reach goals or, or modify behavior. And with, I think, any problem, whether it's a social problem or a personal problem, it begins with problem awareness. So if you're someone battling addiction, you have to know that you've got a drinking problem. A lot of people don't. They're in denial, right? Or if you're someone who is trying to lose weight or gain weight, you have to know that you're underweight or overweight. Sometimes people don't. They have body image issues. And if you're someone who wants to um, solve the problem of racism, you have to know that racism exists. Guess what? It turns out there are a lot of people who don't know that. So any sort of solution begins with awareness of the problem. If you don't think there's a problem, the solution's dead in the water. Not only that, if you create a solution in the absence of awareness of a problem, then the solution will be seen as the problem. So, you know, if an organization, to be more specific, creates, you know, diversity initiatives and all the employees are like, what are you doing? We don't have sexism. We don't have racism. Then it will be seen as reverse sexism or reverse racism because people don't know what you're solving for. So I think any solution begins with P, problem awareness. Is there a problem? That's necessary, but not sufficient. The next step is root cause analysis. Um, do you know where the problem's coming from? And that's not just an academic exercise of exploration or discovery. It's actually critical to coming up with the best course of treatment, because if you know what the cause of the problem is, you'll have some insight into the best way to fix it. So a lot of people don't know that they're sick. That's a problem. There's lack of a problem awareness. You could have cancer and not know it. Um, and, and, and that impedes your um, treatment of, of, you know, of, it keeps the doctors from actually uh, giving you medicine that will make you better because they don't know and you don't know that there's a problem. But assuming that you have symptoms, the doctor's job is to then diagnose you to figure out what's causing your symptoms. And again, that's important because if you have severe headaches, headaches can be caused by lots of things. They can be caused by stress and anxiety can be caused by coronavirus, can be caused by dehydration. And it's important because knowing what's causing your headaches will give the best course of treatment for how to, you know, solve it. Because treating a headache based on, you know, that's due to stress and anxiety or caused by stress and anxiety is very different than treating a headache that's caused by coronavirus. So I think root cause analysis is very important. And when it gets to racism, people often misdiagnose the, the root causes. They think that racism is the product of a few bad apples rather than a whole entire system. And so they think that the solution is to get rid of a couple of rotten apples and that will fix everything. If we just fire Derek Chauvin, then there will be no more problems with the Minneapolis Police Department. So that's the root cause analysis. E is empathy or concern, which in many ways I think is the most important, which is is there sufficient concern and motivation to want to do something about the problem? Assuming that you know there's a problem, assuming that you understand where it comes from, do you care enough to want to do something? And I think, you know, the answer is no when it comes to lots of things. You know, the whole movie Leaving Las Vegas starring Nicolas Cage was about a person who was an unrepentant alcoholic. He was like, yeah. hey, I'm going to go to Vegas and drink myself to death. He did yeah. not care. He did not want to get better. And I think there are people who just don't care about racism because they think that it doesn't affect them or if anything, it gives them more status and, and, and power in society. And so wow. they simply don't care. But assuming you've got those three things, now you can get to the, okay, tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, because if you don't care, if I tell you what to do, you're not going to do very much. Um, and then we get to the fifth thing, which is sacrifice, which is, you know, are you willing to actually do it? So in addition to strategy, there has to be execution, implementation. Uh, any strategy is worthless if you're not able to uh, or willing to invest the time, effort, energy, and resources. So that's kind of the, the overview of the press model. And, and the book kind of follows uh, that, that deep structure. 
Yeah, that, uh, it's a wonderful model. Um, just going back to the very beginning, the, the 10 pounds, maybe some root analysis might be about that chocolate pecan pie. <laughs> maybe just in there as we're using, because I think you can use this model on a lot more bourbon, things than any bourbon, bourbon chocolate, chocolate, chocolate pecan, pecan pie. pie. <laughs> no, no, and seriously, uh, one of the things that you talked about at the very beginning of that was just this idea that there are people out there um, who who don't actually believe that there is racism. And it's one of the things that just, it, it baffles my mind when, when I, I know that that's true and I, I see it, but I just can't grasp, put my hands around that. Well, from your perspective, why does that happen? Why, why are people in denial around things that, again, as we, we kind of look in out, we kind of go, this is pretty apparent. And particularly as you talked about, even some of those, you know, the data points that everybody can can point to and say, oh, yeah, look at all of these data points. But yet it isn't seen as an issue or even maybe conversely that it's the opposite, that that's, it, you know, there's discrimination against white folks as yep. opposed to, you know. Yeah. You know, like I said, that that I'm going to keep this answer short because that could be its own podcast. But I think there are, number, <laughs> yes. there are a number of factors that contribute to that huge blind spot that so many white people in America seem to have. And, and I'm basing this on not only survey data, but scientific data, namely the, the work of my colleague, Michael Norton and Sam Summers, um, who published a study looking at black and white perceptions of racism. Um, but I, I think there are a number of things. One is, you know, this illusion that exceptions create, that people see as uh, evidence of disproving the rule. Um, so, you know, I guess the most salient example would be Obama. How, how could we uh, have racism if we have a black president? And even prior to Obama, you know, how can we have racism if we have a black fill in the blank, a black mayor, a black millionaire, an Oprah Winfrey, a Michael Jackson? Everyone loves Michael Jackson, right? I mean, he's doing really well for himself or, you know, a black CEO or whatever it happens to be. So I think it's, you know, again, yet another example of the availability heuristic where people are able to take um, salient exemplars and then build a whole theory around how these individuals are evidence that the rule is invalid. That if there were as much racism as you claim, then how could we have a black president, for example? Okay. Um, I think it's also um, the result of, of attributional processes. And so if we look at disparities in society, there are two explanations for why the disparity, at least two explanations for why the disparities exist. Uh, one is systemic racism and another is, you know, um, some sort of character or cultural or biological deficiency. And in fact, um, you know, I have a whole chapter in my book, Is It Racism or Is It Race? And I take this head on because many people, even today in the 21st century, assume that there's something deficient about people of color, particularly Black and Latinx, um, that either we don't work hard enough or we are not smart enough or, 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 or something. Um, but that would be an alternative to racism uh, if someone was looking to explain disparities and, and, and its convenient uh, explanation, which gets me to the third, which is motivated reasoning, which is people don't see what they don't want to see. How many times have you been in love with someone and everyone's like, well, I don't know about so-and-so. Um, and you're like, no, not so-and-so. It's just not true. And they show you video and you say, you made that video up. And they photographic evidence. And they say, I saw it. And you're like, no, you're a liar. You didn't, right? And, and you just there's no evidence um, on the planet that will convince you that so-and-so is not the person for you. Um, and so that's what we call insights motivated reasoning, where you yeah. um, basically see what you want to see. You believe what you want to believe because the truth, quote unquote, is a threat. And um, that part of the job of our brains is to protect us from trauma and to protect us from threats. Uh, you know, and I talk about all these cool studies from the 1950s where they subliminally showed people words and they would look at the liminal threshold for when you start to see the word and people could see the words apple and broom before they could see, you know, risque words at the time, like belly, you know, and, and all the, and, and, and yeah. cause their minds are like, no, yeah. no, I didn't, I didn't see that dirty word and it would block it. Right. It would literally 
uh, create this 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 block of of several milliseconds before you could see this word that that your mind didn't didn't want you to see. So I think those are there's some of the reasons why we have so many people um, who buy into the notion that that racism is a relic of the past and that it doesn't characterize life in 21st century America. Okay. Well, we have at least two more podcasts that we're going to have to have you on for. Yes. So we, we're, we're, we're just There's building more. up the repertoire yes. as we go forward here. <laughs> I, I wanted to get to, if I could, just to kind of get to something sort of more specific. Let's just take a hypothetical situation of a middle-aged white guy that has white relatives that at over the Thanksgiving table, uh, one of the white relatives says, I'm not racist. You know, I, I don't have a racist bone in my body. I mean, look at all the nice things that I do, you know, for those black people, you know, how, how can, how can you say that I'm, that I'm racist? Where do, where does somebody go from there? Where, where does this hypothetical middle-aged white guy go from, go from there? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question and, and it's a very common scenario. I've actually seen it and, and not at Thanksgiving. I've seen it at, you know, Easter and Christmas and Valentine's <laughs> Day and, you know, um, but, but I think there's a couple of ways you can address that. One is by sort of challenging or reconceptualizing what the person defines as racism. And I think most lay definitions of racism involve some sort of malice or hatred or violence or malicious intent to harm or, 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 or something along that lines that, that just doesn't permit good people to fall into that category. But if you take a, step, a couple of steps back and you think about racism as just treating people differently, then more people can fall into the category. So going back to, you know, one of the examples that I shared before with the police department, you know, the chief of that particular department said, you know, we were talking and the chief said, you know, I don't have any racist officers in, you know, or just a few, right? When I said, do, do you believe? Because he said, I don't have any. And I said, are you sure? And he says, well, if I think about it, maybe one to 2%. I said, you know, what, what percentage would you estimate are, are racist? And he said, one to 2%. And then I described a scenario. I said, imagine there's this alternate universe and we're going to have two of them. And in one universe, there's a group of white teenagers who are goofing off. Um, you've set up a blockade and they're moving the orange co cones around and they're just sort of acting silly, putting the cones on their heads and, you know, you know, just just causing a ruckus. And in the other universe, you've got a group of black teenagers doing the same thing. So I want you to imagine this is sort of a sci-fi experiment that you could transport your officers to each of those universes without knowing that they had been in the previous one. How many of your officers do you think would treat the black teenagers differently? By differently, I mean more harshly than the white teenagers. And he said about 80%. Mm. And I said, so then about 80% of your officers are racist. And he said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. They're, they're good people. And I said that, that, you know, so then we got into a whole conversation about what it means. And in my book, I describe it as, you know, any sort of decision, behavior, action that advantages one group over another group or that creates a disparity or a difference. That racism resides in the delta or the change in how people are, are, create, are, are, are treated. If you give a black pedestrian a jaywalking ticket, even though it's illegal, but you don't give a white pedestrian a jaywalking ticket, that's racism. Even though you were in your right, well, you were well within your right as a, a police officer to give that jaywalking ticket. Um, that that you know, no one can sue you for that. But if there is disparate impact and there's a concept of law of disparate impact, then they can. And I think people have to start thinking about racism in terms of disparate impact and not necessarily malicious intent. I, I love that. And it, it brings me to so many things. I've seen the, the videos of, you know, where people have gone out where there has been a white person walking around town with an automatic rifle fully within their rights versus, you know, somebody, uh, you know, and the, the police coming and talking to that person versus, you know, the, the similar age black, you know, person doing the same thing where they are, you know, have cars coming up and guns pointed and, and variety of other factors. And I, I don't necessarily want to get into that. What I want to get into is, is thinking about, so your book is about a converse, you know, it's, it's titled conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think, so what are the ways that we can start these conversations to help in eliminating that Delta, as you say, in, in getting people to see that, yeah, it is 
that it doesn't need to be malicious that the fact that we actually just treat people different that is a delta that that's real what are some of those things that you could help our listeners um as they are going about their everyday life to to help them achieve that yeah so you know I, I, a number of things and i lay out about four or five um you know helpful rules in the book that i think can uh, increase the likelihood of having a, a productive and and an engaging conversation um but one of is wanting to actually have a conversation and and that sounds obvious but i think all too often people want to have an adversarial debate Mm. in other words when people get together to have the conversation the goal is to win almost as you know if we use the analogy of the prosecutor and the defense they're not there to listen to each other unless they can get a gotcha moment or something, but they're not really there to listen to each other in the service of finding out the truth. In fact, you could argue they don't even care about the truth. What Mm -hmm. they care about is the verdict. But I think you have to be a dispassionate judge or juror who actually is concerned about the truth and they're listening to all the sides and they're kind of, but I think all too often people approach the conversation as if it was the prosecution and the defense rather than a bunch of jurors in the back room. Um, sort of crunching all the evidence. And so that's why the subtitle of my book is, you know, how seeking and speaking the truth about racism. I think there is a search for truth in this conversation process that often does not happen uh, when people get together to talk. There's very little concern about the truth, people. And and, and you're seeing that more and more as we become more and more polarized. And I won't get into politics here, but there's, it's clear that often Truth is not the goal. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, it's not, right? Um, no. There's a whole, and, and, and so I think that has to be the primary mission of the conversation is to sort of, you know, get to the question, like, does racism exist? And how do we know? And what are the root causes? And, you know, how much do I care? Do I care enough? But I think one of the barriers, once people do decide that they want to seek the truth, you know, and there have been whole books written on this, um, and there's, you know, the concept of white fragility is is almost like the movie A Few Good Men. You know, you want the truth, you can't handle it, right? <laughs> right. That's where we're at, right? Okay. So, so you know, I, I think there are a lot of things that, that have to happen for yeah. people to put themselves psychologically in the right mindset to be able, you know, and this is some of Carol Dweck's work, because I do yeah. believe very much in growth mindset and not a fixed mindset. And and otherwise I wouldn't have written this book, but, you know, I I sort of talk about how you can, you know, create situations that aren't as threatening for people. So for example, focusing on the task and not the person. So often in organizations, you can say, how do we solve this problem versus it's your fault or your fault or you're an idiot or you're a racist, right? And and this is some of the work from Eddie Jen, uh, who's looked at um, types of conflict and some types of conflict are good if they focus on the task and you get lots of different perspectives and opinions about how to do something. It's good that people disagree because it brings more information to the table. But if it's person-based conflict or ad hominem attacks, then it's not good and it shuts the whole conversation down. So, so I talk about a number of different factors like that, that create sort of the right tone, the right context, the right level of psychological safety while also having candor. That's my colleague Amy Edmondson's work. Um, yeah. Then, then you know, I, I think it, it, it exponentially increases the likelihood of having a more productive conversation. It, re- it reminds me of uh, Kwame Christian's work in uh, with negotiations. He talks about starting with compassionate curiosity. Yeah. And that's, it's so hard when I, when I try to apply it myself, I got to be completely candid with you it's hard as hell Mm -hmm. to 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 actually really be open to what whatever this person is talking about i have to really listen because my brain naturally goes into that i just want to convince them Mm -hmm. you know I, i get into that that attorney kind of thing and um and it really it, it, it is is part of it actually just literally literally preparing yourself to kind of actually sort of not psych yourself up, but say, okay, I really need to go into this conversation to listen. I need to go in with compassion. I need to go in with empathy. I think so, I, and I also think it's a it's a uh, a matter of self compassion in a way, um, and and self affirmation. I think if you engage in certain affirmational exercises before you do it, then you will feel less ego defensive Mm. Um, because I think, 
you know, most liberal white people's biggest fear is that they'll wake up one day and realize they really are racist, right? Um, mm-hmm. And it's like, oh my God, you know, I, I, life is, you know, and and I, I think what you have to do is is get out of this apocalyptic mindset that somehow in this conversation you're going to say something that will forever uh, brand you as a bigot or you're going to learn something that will forever, you know, that, you know, you're, you're a good person. And, and, you know, again, there've been books written about the Dolly Chug wrote a book called, you know, the person you mean to be right. And, oh, and that. so there, there are these books about, you know, the perfect, not getting in the way of the good and, and not putting so many eggs in the basket that you crack them all. Uh, right. And, and, yeah. um, and, and so I think part of it is, is, is people not really psyching themselves so much to think that their whole self-concept rests on what is exchanged in that conversation in the next 45 minutes. And that, again, you can grow. That even if you say something that's offensive or you you will learn something, you will learn a lesson. There can be no growth without a certain amount of, of discomfort or pain. And we talk about the, the learning zone being nestled between the comfort zone and the danger zone. If everything's so comfortable, it's too familiar and you're not doing anything differently. You're not learning anything differently. If it's so dangerous that it's traumatic, right, you shut down. But I think you have to sort of find this in between where you're willing to go outside of your comfort zone uh, and you're willing to make a fool of yourself or you're willing to put your foot in your mouth. Um, and it's not the end of the world. And, and you'd be surprised and, and how gracious people can be when they see that someone is actually trying. So yeah. the, this whole conversation it keeps leading me back to the the last S in your press, right? This mm-hmm. the sacrifice piece, and I love that it's termed as sacrifice because it feels it, again wondering your thoughts on like people may not start these conversations because they're afraid that that sacrifice is going to be too big, whether Mm -hmm. it be reputational, as you said, whether it be what I need to subsequently do if I find that maybe I, I, I have racist tendencies or I am a racist in different pieces. And what does that mean? And, and then part of me is going, do we need to elevate that individual cost to a larger feeling of, well, if I don't do this, what are the long-term costs or what are the societal costs? And, and again, just would love your thoughts on how how sacrifice is is uh, a potential limiter and what we can do about that, if you have any thoughts on that. I do. I have a lot of thoughts about that, and I'll try to condense them because I have thoughts about it at the organizational level, like mm-hmm. what are the sacrifices that an organization has to make in order to do diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging well? What are the sacrifices that individuals, um, in particular white people, feel that they have to make um, if if they do this anti-racism work well? And, and you know, um, so I'll, I'll sort of start with the organizations. Um, I think a lot of organizations believe that they'll have to sacrifice two things, two things that are very dear to them, one being quality and the other being fairness. I think there's an assumption, and it's often not explicitly voiced, but I think tacitly held assumption that if we do diversity well, that it will lower the standards, our organization, that that often what we're looking at is a trade-off between the diverse candidate and the best candidate, and never the twain shall meet. And I spent a lot of time in the book talking about how it really isn't a trade-off. In fact, doing diversity right will increase, uh, often can increase performance, quality, outcomes, productivity, et cetera. The second one is this whole idea that there's a trade-off between diversity and fairness, that if I do diversity well, then I'm really discriminating against white people, that there's sort of this uh, pro-diversity means anti-white. And so I think a lot of leaders and organizations are reluctant, and, and I could go into more reasons. There, are, Those are just two, quote unquote, sacrifices, but I think neither one is a sacrifice. And I make a distinction between equity and equality, um, and people often confuse the two terms, but you know, equality is when everyone gets the same thing. Um, and equity is when people get different things, but there's a correspondence between the inputs and the outputs. So you know, if four people go to dinner and they all order different things, the bill comes, it's $200. How do you split the bill? What's fair? 
in some cultures or some people will say, let's just split it four ways and we each pay 50. That's equality. Some people might say, no, you ordered steak and lobster and I ordered a Caesar salad. So you pay 90 bucks and I pay 30 bucks. That's equity, right? And, you know, you know I, t- I tell the story about being at a track meet when I was eight years old, confusing equity and equality and being furious at the track officials because my favorite cousin was running and I thought everyone else had been given a head start because they had to run around the track and it was a staggered start. And he was on the inside lane and, and I just didn't understand. I said, wait, wait, why is everyone ahead of him? Right? Because I'm looking down at the track and I see, you know, the person next to him about five yards ahead and the other person another five yards ahead and five yards. And I'm like, what's going on? And I wanted an equal starting line. I wanted them to pull everyone back, line them shoulder to shoulder, fire the pistol and let them run. And everyone in the family tried to explain to me uh, to, to no avail, right? This was, <laughs> this was fair. They're like, no, this is a fair race. And I'm like, it is not a fair race. They've given everybody a head start, right? I was confusing equity and equality. I wanted an equal starting line, meaning everyone had exactly the same starting line. But what I was looking at were different starting lines that were nonetheless equitable. They were treating people differently in a way that made sense because you know there were different distances to run in each lane. I think using that silly mundane example, many people in our world today confuse those two. They think we actually are running on a straightaway track and that you should treat everyone the same. And they don't realize it is a round, it's an oval track because it's been designed that way. And certain groups have been relegated to the inside lanes and certain groups to the various outside lanes. And depending on which group you are, you have a different lane and you have a different distance to run. You're not running the same race. Um, and so what DE and I is trying to do is what I saw at the racetrack. It's staggering the starts, but then you have people say, wait a minute, like me as an eight-year-old, you know, you're giving them a, a head start, right? <laughs> And so the point of all of that is you can't make an intelligent judgment about fairness if you don't understand the track that you're running on or the system that you're operating. And so many people, and I guess, you know, as an eight-year-old, I didn't understand the principles of geometry enough to even have an informed opinion uh, about what I was blathering on about. I say that's the analog to many um, people who make these claims about sacrifice of fairness in the same way that I made a claim about sacrifice of fairness. But I just didn't really understand the system well enough. This this image, uh, now our listeners aren't, aren't going to be able to see it, but I love this image that you refer to several times in the book yeah. with this idea of people standing behind a, a fence, wanting to, to look over the fence at uh, at a soccer game. Mm-hmm. You know, or excuse me, Mary, football game. And uh, <laughs> and here here we are just saying, well, if, if there's someone who's really short and they have the same size, um, they have exactly the same box that they're standing on as, as the taller people, the, sm- the shorter person just can't see. So yeah. it, it it's not really helpful for them to have a shorter box. They need it. They need a taller box. Right. And, and, and it's also because if you go a couple of other pages, it's, it's not because there are inherent differences in height. Right. Yeah. It gets back to the it's because the ground is unlevel and the fence is unlevel. Right. And, and so you've got these structural inequities that are affecting access to the game. And so what do you do? And then at the individual level, you know, I hear so much. There's so much conversation about, you know, open season on white males that, you know, um, a, a lot of these are creating sacrifices, you know, quote unquote, um, among uh, white males. But you know, I look at it in a slightly different way that I think many people would find hard to digest uh, and internalize, which is it's not that they're making a sacrifice. It's that the default is a form of affirmative action for white males, that really our default is not a level playing field that people assume it is, that the default is that all else being equal if you're a white male, you sort of are, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 yards uh, ahead of the other runners in the game. How else could you explain, you know, the fact that 30% of the American population occupies 90% of Fortune 500 positions or 90% of U.S. president positions or 90% of, you know, you could go on and on. And it's down from 100%. It's, it's yeah. 90% now. At one point, it was 100% for all those. Right. So we had 
30 to 40 percent occupying 100 percent could you really make a merit-based argument for that kind yeah. of over representation so it's not that they're losing anything i sort of argue that they've gotten more goodies than they actually deserved and what we're going for is actually something that's closer to a level playing field but i think that that really throws people for a loop when you <laughs> yeah. paint it that way but i, I love think that it's true. like you can actually it's back to the data like you, you, yeah you know um but 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 so it's not a sacrifice it's that no. you are you're giving up your surplus or you're giving up your unearned benefit. Well, it's, it's, we have the inside track, Yeah, there you, you know, go. we have the inside track and, and we might even have the inside track with the, the starting line five, 10 yards in yeah. advance, as opposed to the other way around. Right. And, and so therefore, yeah, it makes, I, I, I love that example. And I love just the way that you've personalized this to, to these things. Cause I think it truly does illuminate this in a way that, you know, stories like this, it goes back to this conversation piece. It's the stories that people can get their hands around um, and understand that are going to start moving the the needle on this. And I, I going back to what you said at the very beginning of this, where you said, you know, is racism, you know, solvable? And you said emphatic yes, You but you also qualified that with yes it is it's possible to 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 end it but is it probable well maybe not and that comes down to us and what we do yeah and so yeah and i want to say something about what you just said about that inside lane and being you know five yards ahead and so forth and so on i'm not sure if you could have explained to me when i was eight years old that you know it really was a fair race and and so forth and so on if, if I still would have accepted it, because what I wanted more than anything was for my cousin to win. And I think as an immature eight-year-old, I really didn't care um, in, in some ways if it was a fair race or not. And I think for many people who benefit from the system, I think, A, there's a sense of entitlement because, you know, they feel that's the way things should be. Um, but the second is, you know, I, I think a lot of people are not as concerned uh, and we have data, I, I, I cite data in the book, are not as concerned about fairness as they are about winning. And again, without getting political, we, we see a lot of evidence of this, that, you know, people are not as concerned about the truth or about fairness as they are about winning. But then I think they have to look themselves in the mirror and say, this is who I am and, and I'm willing to cheat to win or I'm willing to, uh, you know, um, but, because I think one thing is people knowing but another thing is people saying, OK, I'm going to do something to reset the starting lines and take away the head start that I have. And, and some people would argue that, that it's not rational for someone who's poised to win to do that. And so I think this gets into the E of the, the, the model, the E, the empathy, the concern, the sort of moral obligation um, to certain standards of behavior, even if they conflict with one's own outcomes and, and self-interest. Yeah. We're going to have you back. I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go that on the record right now, Robert, because this is such a great conversation. I, I have to, I don't have an easy segue to this, but I am curious about your musical interests. Okay. Let's okay. just, let's just put it out there. And I'm, I'm curious if you were to spend a year on a desert Island, mm -hmm. are there, what two artists, musical artists catalog would you take with you? What, what, what two music, influences would you want to have on that desert island for a year so the first i think it, it would be really easy it would be stevie wonder um who i that, think is that's probably, easy yeah one of the best um musicians ever ever um in terms of you know his his talent on instrument his vocal talent and his lyrical talent all yeah. together right as a songwriter as as a vocalist and as a pianist uh, in, in various other instruments. I Drummer, uh, Drummer, bass, uh, guitar. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 you just name all the instruments. So I, I love Stevie Wonder and I sort of grew up uh, listening to him. So it's it's nostalgic as well. You know, my, my family <laughs> listens to Stevie Wonder. So it's the like comedy. songs from the key of life. Does that just like. Exactly. Oh right? my God. Yeah. You yeah. just brought back so many memories. Like I remember the album cover. You remember kind of psychedelic <sighs> with all the, the, um, like a, the squirrels. Like a, <laughs> yeah, it was. yeah yeah <laughs> um and and then second i think would be miles davis um wow. and uh i i i played i'm used to be a jazz musician as well and that was one of the reasons i decided 
uh, to go to New Orleans. And I was in band from you know elementary school all the way through um, uh, high school. And um, I like his irreverence um, as well as, the, you know, and he was kind of somebody who did things his own way and, you know, was successful at it, right, in spite of himself. Um, so I admire Miles on a number of different levels. So those would be the two artists I'd, I'd take with me. Stevie. Yeah. What instrument did you play, Robert? What so was I was that? woodwinds. Um, okay. I, clarinet, saxophone, yeah. mostly. Did you get in, ever get into the, the double uh, reed, oboe. the oboe yeah. or bassoon? Yeah, but, you know, it, it, it always hard. sounded like I was killing a cat. I was strangling out of the And, it, you know... People around me would say, just stop, just stop. Like, <laughs> why the whole band tunes to the oboe. It, it just, you know. Adds- yeah. <laughs> well, what is the, you know, uh, Miles, I, I was fortunate enough to get exposed to Miles Davis when I was in high school and um, couldn't help but fall in love. But then just a few years ago, they they released some alternative cuts, alternative takes to uh, from Blue. And uh, there was one on, uh, what's the tune about Spain? The... Um, there's a song uh, I, I can't remember the title now, but they did three takes on on this one song, and you couldn't recognize that they were the same song. The, mm. he, he pushed the boundaries. You talk about yeah. irreverence. He yeah, pushed the yeah. boundaries of what that melody and what the cadence and and the general form of the song so far out that you couldn't say all three of those songs were the same. Mm-hmm. But but mm-hmm. it was it it was just fantastic, and I thought that is absolute musical genius right there it is to, to it have is. that ability to think through that in that way it's just just amazing yeah okay we're okay again uh, may, that'll be our third podcast okay <laughs> we're just going to talk about stevie wonder and miles davis okay <laughs> but but robert livingston it has been such a pleasure to have you today uh, as a guest on behavioral grooves thank you so much we, we really appreciate your time and your contributions thank you it's good to be here maybe next time you have me back we, we've had such a great conversation. We didn't get into solutions. So I guess we uh-huh. to figure yeah. out, you know, what do we do to solve it? Because I do think it's solvable. So this has been great. Thanks, guys. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Robert, have a free flowing conversation and talk about whatever else comes into our change shirt brains. Change shirt. Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this, this, uh, go ahead. You tell I the story. That. You tell the story. Well, no, no, no. Actually, no, you, you brought it up. And I love that you brought that up because it happened off mic. It happened before we it started happened. recording. So, so we we got on. We we do all of our uh, interviews on Squadcast for this, or most of them, by the way. And it has a video component, but we don't record that video. Uh, but Robert came on and, and you know, we just by chance all happened uh, Tim, myself, and Mary all happened to be wearing, you know, these black shirts on. And it, Total coincidence. We did yeah. not plan this. And Robert was wearing, I think, some blue shirt or something like that. And he's like, oh, wait, I missed out on the memo. And he said, hang on, hang on. Shut off his camera. Went and like literally he's gone 30 seconds and he comes back and he has on this this black shirt. And yeah. I thought it, it yeah. was it was very interesting. But it also, I think, goes to show that he was really trying to say, look, we're in this together, that we're yeah. going to be, we're, if, if, if this is yeah. how we're coming in and approaching this, this is what we're going to do. And I loved it. It was just, it, it really fit with kind of the rest of this conversation, which was really talking about our personal, you know, it, Robert's personal kind of stories interwoven with the research, but really mm-hmm. building this as we're a community and as a community, we're in this together. And I love that part. Yeah. yeah. I think for the and just for the sake of full disclosure, I think mine was actually like navy blue. No, but yeah, fine, Mister <laughs> Houlihan, go and throw this whole theory out the window. There you go. Yeah. No, let's. We have to start with this wonderful optimism he has, com- accompanied with the fact that racism is still very much a problem. Yeah, it's 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 not like it just sort of exists in the back corners. It's still prevalent and, and an issue today, and um, and that paired with his idea that it is solvable is wonderful to me. I think that it's an important message to take away from this conversation. He has a very pragmatic approach to this, which I find really reassuring because he's not Pollyanna on it, nor is he doom and gloom on it. It is a 
wonderful look at this idea that, yes, as I said, it is solvable, but is it probable? You know, it's like the idea of we, you know, I know I need to lose probably 30 pounds. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? Uh, if I do yeah. the right things, yes, it yeah. is. Yes. Yeah. That, but that's those it. hard it's doing, but it's yeah. the doing part and the, those doing things are hard. And we mm-hmm. know from all of the work that we do that oftentimes those hard things don't get done and we have to put systems in place. We have to build out, we have to understand what are the roadblocks that get in our way of losing weight. Also of bigger, you know, societal issues of, you know, like ending racism. I think it's really, really kind of key. And I love, again, he brings this insight to a level where he brings these analogies to play that just make things understandable and relatable. And I really appreciate that about the conversation that we had, but it also comes very comes out very loudly in his book yeah it also how could we miss uh, and we 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 have to address the idea that the conversation the name of his book so beautifully pairs up with one of our favorite guests uh kwame christian (laughs) and and his his focus on compassionate curiosity like this whole idea of and and his is like he started this whole idea of compassionate curiosity in in the world of negotiation and persuasion and gosh how we have how you and I have seen compassionate curiosity unfold in all kinds of discussions any any kind of business discussion is so it's such an important thing to, as a foundation to use compassionate curiosity to be curious and open and 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 give people a little grace it's it's an important start. Yeah. So go for people for people who haven't listened to it. It's episode one seventy eight, back from October of twenty twenty. But it's amazing to me, Tim, how often we come back to this idea of compassionate curiosity. Not just in this episode, not just in Kwame's original episode, but in multitude of episodes and even beyond the podcast, just in the world that we work in, it's a really powerful idea, this idea that we need to hold these conversations, as Robert is saying, but the idea behind those conversations really comes back down to this idea that Kwame is talking about, which is about compassionate curiosity. We have, If we have compassionate curiosity in these conversations that is going to lead to some of the positive outcomes that we are, that Robert is hoping for, that we're hoping for, that I think most people are hoping for. As long as it's part of a conversation, a dialogue, it's between two people, you know, that I I don't want to underemphasize the simplicity of that. I think that that's really important. Uh, Kurt, what else did you want to groove on? Oh man, I could groove on so much. I think the big piece for me, one of the big pieces is that Robert gave, I thought, one of the best analogies for the idea that equality and equity are not the same thing. This idea of him going to see his cousin race when he was eight years old on an oval racetrack, and that the starting spots for people were different. And as much as people were trying to explain that, no, this was fair, that this was a equal opportunity, that no, they need to all start together, which is the way that we often see, you know, um, equity, right? Or equal, equality. You know, so right. We think yeah. of equality yeah. as everybody has the same starting uh, line. When right. equity says, actually, in order to make it equitable, we need to have different starting places. Uh, on d- the rack. different starting places because the distance that we're running is, is, needs to needs be, to the, be same. the same. It's not right. where we need to start. It's how much we need to do in order to get there. And that really struck me. Yeah, absolutely. It, it combined with this idea of, uh, of fairness, you know, people thinking that fairness is also equality, that, that to be fair is, is, uh, you know, I, 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 I get the candy bar and we break it in half and fair is you get half and I get half. Um, but 
but it would be like, you know, if there was a, a shorter person ask, you know, that needed to clean the windows and the windows are really tall, you wouldn't say, well, you just have to, you just have to clean the, the high windows. I, give them, give them a ladder, right? It's not that they're incapable of cleaning the windows. It's just that they just need a ladder to get there. And he, again, he talked about this in the, in the, in the, Splitting up the dinner bill, right? Oh, right. So if right. if I'm going out to dinner and we just split it equal between you and me, you know, and I have the, you know, the cheese, you know, grilled cheese sandwich, and you have the steak, you know, fillet, yeah. which you always do, oh, of course. You, you take that of steak course. fillet, <laughs> and uh, you know, and then you go, oh, let's just split it fifty fifty. I'll order after you, know, you order. With, with, <laughs> yeah. Well, of course you order after we order, and then you order the, the you know, the the twenty dollar glass of wine sure. and all that other stuff where I'm getting water. <laughs> you know, is that uh, yeah? It's equal, you know, but it's, it's not it's equitable, not equitable, right? right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and along yeah. those lines, uh, when he talked about the availability heuristic, I thought that that was a really good point just to remind listeners of that this idea that just because we see Oprah running a big successful business or the fact that Barack Obama has become president that doesn't mean that racism is solved you know? no and actually i think that's that's a really good point that we too often kind of dismiss it at least for you know us right where it's like oh well obviously that must be it because i can pull up these examples of these successful people and so if they can do it well then that means that we're no longer have the sy systemic racism that is keeping others back well and that's you know there are exceptions to the rule all the time yeah. and that is an interesting it's a very important not interesting very important uh disclaimer on this idea that no just because we do have those examples yes that means it can happen but it doesn't mean that it's likely to happen again it's the it's it is a solvable but is it probable right and so there we go uh what well, else? I, I, I think we should mention the press model just to quickly reiterate for folks that, that this press model starts with P on problem awareness, uh, and then it moves to R for root cause analysis, and then to E for empathy, and then the, maybe the big payoff uh, comes in strategy and sacrifice, the last two S's. Yeah. That's, that's a, it's a great model, I think, for, uh, for us to think about uh, how, to, how to deal with these kinds of uh, co conversations, really. Yeah, I, I think we could spend a long time talking about press, right? Robert does in the book, which, by the way, go out, buy the book. It's fantastic yeah, it's great read. Uh, and read it. But for me, I think just to dig in deep on one, it's this last S. Oh, yeah. This last S, this idea of sacrifice, which is, I think, an impediment from us of achieving some of this anti-racism, this equality, that this equity piece that we want to do, because it implies that we have to give something up. And we know loss aversion kicks in. We know that it is so hard to do something if we're going to have to pay some sacrifice yeah. for this, whether that be time, energy, money, opportunity, whatever it would be, even even if it's not real, if it's not a real loss, but a per potential perceived, or perceived yeah. loss, you know, we're entrenched in our own self-interest in ways that I don't think we always recognize and that act in ways that we don't always realize. Yeah. Well, what did Robert say? Like, the United States has had affirmative action for white men for the last 250 years. <laughs> so, so, so the, 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 and this gets back to what you're saying, Kurt, it is the perceived loss. It, it, it may not actually be a real loss because overall, when the tide comes in, all the boats rise. Like we're going to benefit from a world that with less racism. And I mean, if we can eliminate it, holy cow, all the better, but corporations are already stronger. I, I, I see it in the, in the, companies that we've worked with in the past five years and the company that I'm with now, man, this idea of having these multicultural teams, it's with, with a highly psychologically safe environment, man, you get tremendous productivity, really, really great thinking, great ideas, great execution. Like just, let's just do it. And to, to that point, I, one of the things that I loved about the book, I loved about our conversation, and I think is a powerful takeaway from this, is this idea that while, yes, uh, it's 
everybody's issue on an individual level basis to kind of take this into account and to do what you can in order to to stop this racism and kind of understand where you're coming in and apply press. It is vital for leaders, whether that's a leader of a small company, a medium-sized company, or a large company. You are the person who can make this influence. And we're going to, we have uh, Chuck Weisner, who we talked to again, uh, and uh, Vanessa Bonds, who talk about leaders impact, you know, just in conversation, we're talking conversation here, Chuck Weisner talks about leaders are 10 X more powerful in their conversations, because we're paying attention to them. Vanessa says that that spotlight is on leaders. And we look to them. And again, that there's great power in their words and actions. Leaders can take this and make this a reality much faster than we can us little peons that we are. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, Lastly, can I just do a quick shout out to Stevie Wonder's 1976 Songs from the Key of Life? It was such a fantastic record. If, If you've not listened to Songs from the Key of Life, man, it will make your day just a little bit brighter. I guarantee it. And having that conversation with Robert reminded me of that. So I just wanted to say that again. Well, I think, uh, yes. And I think that's probably a really good place to wrap this episode up to (laughs) the, the, you know, keys of life. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Um, We want to remind listeners that uh, racism is still very much a problem in the world. But as Robert says, it is solvable. It is solvable. Yeah. And, and, that having a meaningful, compassionate conversation with people, you know, when we do that, we can pave the road to a more equitable future with organizations that are more productive and communities that are safer for everyone. So we encourage you that, you know, this week, take a little bit of compassionate curiosity with you. Take that out into the world. Use the press model to help make your workplace, your, you know, church, your community, whatever else it is, a little bit more of an equitable environment for all the employees, all the community members, and use that to go out and find your group. 